In this series, we are going to focus on gastric cancer. There are a few key types of gastric cancer that you will need to be aware of for your boards. These include gastric adenocarcinoma, including the intestinal and diffuse subtypes. We will also review the Kruckenberg tumor, as well as malt lymphoma. I will also note here for the sake of completeness that you may see mention of GI stromal tumors or GIST tumors. But in my experience working with students over the years for this exam, but in my experience working with many students, these GI stromal tumors simply are not as high yield as these other three subtypes of gastric cancer. And therefore, as we focus on these three types, I would just like you to keep in mind that for all of these types of gastric cancer, endoscopy with biopsies is going to be our gold standard for diagnosis. Just to briefly review some anatomy of the stomach before we move forward in our discussion of gastric cancer, keep in mind that on this long end of the stomach here, this is referred to as the greater curvature of the stomach, whereas this here on the shorter end is referred to as the lesser curvature. This will come into play later in this series in our discussion of intestinal versus diffuse types of gastric cancer. As the intestinal subtype of gastric adenocarcinoma really likes to affect this lesser curvature of the stomach. Without further ado, let's jump into our first type of gastric cancer, which you are most likely to see on your examinations, which is the gastric adenocarcinoma. This is going to present classically as a patient from East Asia, in particular China, Japan, or Korea. These patients are going to present with nausea and vomiting, abdominal pain, and weight loss. These patients also classically present with iron deficiency anemia. There are also several key findings that we may see on physical exam depending on metastases from a gastric adenocarcinoma. In the case of metastasis to the liver, the patient may present with a right upper quadrant mass. Examiners also frequently test you on Virchow's node, which is an enlarged left supracravicular node. And we also should remind ourselves of Sister Mary Joseph nodules, which present as a painful periumbilical nodule. As we stated on the previous slide, Virchow's node is an enlargement of the left supracavicular node. We have an example of this here. As you can see, this left supracavicular node is clearly enlarged when we compare it to the opposite side. And this is a classic sign of metastasis from a gastric adenocarcinoma. As we stated previously, gastric adenocarcinoma is classically going to present on examination questions as a patient from East Asia while I do not expect you to be a master of geographical regions, I would just like to remind you here in East Asia that we can clearly see that we have China, as well as North and South Korea, as well as Japan. Therefore, vignettes for gastric adenocarcinoma will often have a patient who is an immigrant from one of these three key regions in East Asia. The underlying pathophysiology of gastric adenocarcinoma appears to be related to the fact that these regions in East Asia have diets which are rich in nitrates and salt. In particular, these nitrates, which go on to form nitrosamines, are notorious for causing inflammation of the stomach, ultimately leading over time to chronic inflammation and eventually the development of gastric adenocarcinoma. It should also be noted that adenocarcinoma has two key types with different manifestations of which we need to be aware. It is also important to note that gastric adenocarcinoma has two key subtypes that we need to be aware of. These include the intestinal as well as the diffuse subtypes. In the intestinal subtype of gastric adenocarcinoma, as we mentioned previously, this really likes to affect that lesser curvature of the stomach. This subtype classically presents as an ulcer with raised margins on that lesser curvature. When we perform an endoscopy and take biopsies of this specimen, we're going to see a glandular histopathology. And it must also be noted that this intestinal subtype has a strong association with H. pylori, and therefore patients may present with signs and symptoms of H. pylori infection prior to the development of this intestinal adenocarcinoma. In contrast, when we perform an endoscopy in our patients with a diffuse subtype of gastric adenocarcinoma, these patients classically are going to have lenitis plastica, which is where the stomach wall is diffusely thickened and leathery in appearance. When we perform a biopsy during that endoscopy procedure, these patients classically are going to have signet ring cells, 
and for this reason the diffuse subtype of gastric adenocarcinoma is sometimes referred to as signet ring cell carcinoma. On histopathology, these cells, which we will see in the coming slides, are filled with mucin in the middle, which then pushes out the nuclei to the periphery. Unlike its intestinal counterpart, the diffuse subtype of gastric adenocarcinoma is not associated with H. pylori, and unfortunately it has a very poor prognosis. Just to hammer this home once again, in our intestinal subtype of gastric adenocarcinoma, this is really going to like to affect this lesser curvature of the stomach here. In contrast, in our diffuse subtype of gastric adenocarcinoma, this is going to tend to diffusely affect the stomach rather than a particular region. Here's a classic example of the endoscopy appearance of the diffuse subtype. As we can see, the stomach wall here is diffusely thickened throughout the length of the stomach rather than involving a particular region. For this reason, the appearance of this diffuse subtype has often been termed lenitis plastica or a leather bottle-like appearance. And this image is something extremely important to be aware of for your boards. There's also a classic histopathology for the diffuse subtype, which is the signet ring cells that we see in this particular cancer subtype. We have an example of this in this region here, where you can see these mucin-filled cells in the middle, whereas the nuclei actually move to the periphery of the cell, thus resulting in a signet ring. And for this reason, the diffuse subtype of gastric adenocarcinoma is sometimes referred to as a signet ring cell carcinoma. As we've now hinted at extensively, the diagnostic test of choice for gastric adenocarcinoma is going to be an endoscopy with biopsies. In the case of the intestinal subtype, we are going to see glandular histopathology, whereas in the case of our diffuse type of adenocarcinoma, we will see those classic signet ring cells. Additionally, once we have confirmed the presence of cancer, we will normally get a CT of the abdomen for staging purposes, as this is ultimately going to affect our management. We treat patients with gastric adenocarcinoma surgically, generally with a gastrectomy or partial gastrectomy. And in the case of gastric adenomas, which are metastatic, we can also use chemotherapy as well as debulking. However, generally, once this has metastasized, it carries a very poor prognosis. One classic example of such a metastasis is a metastasis to the ovaries, which is termed a Kruckenberg tumor. A Kruckenberg tumor is going to generally metastasize to both ovaries and is going to be bilateral in 80% of cases. The most common source of the Kruckenberg tumor is a gastric adenocarcinoma. It is classically going to present similarly to other types of ovarian cancers with abdominal pain, bloating, and even ascites. The Kruckenberg tumor can be diagnosed on a CT of the abdomen and pelvis, and generally we are going to manage these patients with a combination of surgery as well as chemo and radiation. Moving on to the MALT lymphoma, with MALT standing for Mucosa Associated Lymphatic Tissue, this is generally going to present with epigastric pain, nausea, and weight loss. The pathophysiology of a MALT lymphoma is pretty fascinating in that it is actually due to a chronic H. pylori infection, which leads to chronic inflammation and ultimately the development of a lymphoma. Therefore, when we go to perform our upper GI endoscopy and obtain biopsies from these lesions, we are going to see lymphoma on the histopathology. And from that point, we should also absolutely perform H. pylori testing in these patients. What is so incredible about malt lymphoma is that the management for this, rather than being surgical, at least in the majority of patients, is actually with the use of quadruple therapy for helicobacter pylori. We therefore treat these patients with our quadruple therapy regimen, which consists of bismuth, subcitrate potassium, omeprazole, metronidazole, and tetracycline. Please note that when compared to our triple therapy regimen, that the only common thread here is going to be the proton pump inhibitor, or in this case, omeprazole. And this is, of course, in contrast to our triple therapy regimen for our patients with H. pylori, in which we use amoxicillin, clarithromycin, and once again, this PPI, in this case, omeprazole.
But I'm just making this point to point out here that the antibiotics we use in quadruple therapy, which are metronidazole and tetracycline, differ from those that we use in our triple therapy regimen. If you can differentiate the intestinal and diffuse subtypes of gastric adenocarcinoma, understand the Kruckenberg tumor as well as malt lymphoma, then you should be in excellent shape for answering these questions on your examinations. This is Boards MD, and this is Gastric Cancer.